Welcome to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain, seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest this week is Evan Maloney. He's an independent film documentary maker and director and producer of the 2007 documentary, Indoctrinate You. Evan Maloney, welcome to Inside Academia. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for having me, Andy. Your documentary chronicles a host of, I guess, what you can call egregious violations of uh, First Amendment rights uh, with speech codes and politically charged double standards in uh, disciplinary processes that take place against students in different universities and colleges. And you chronicle many different things going on in your one-hour documentary. Uh, I don't want to give it all away, but I would like to spotlight a few key examples in the documentary. First, uh, give us a background as to how you got started with this. What propelled you to want to make this film in the first place? Uh, when I was at Bucknell University, uh, it was right at the beginning of the era of political correctness breaking into mass consciousness. There was an infamous case at the University of Pennsylvania referred to as the Water Buffalo case. And that was, I think, the first seminal case of political correctness run amok on college campuses. This was the first time that I really became aware that it wasn't just on my college campus where people could get in trouble for saying very mild things. Uh, the incident at the University of Pennsylvania involved a student who was being disrupted by a group of students in a quad below his window, and he yelled, shut up, you water buffalo, or something to that effect. Now, uh, I believe he was Israeli. That term meant something specific, that the group was being loud and disruptive. For whatever reason, the people in the group decided that it was actually a racial epithet. The minute race gets involved in the discussion, there's automatically an assumption of guilt. And so this student, merely by being accused of being a racist, found himself in front of this Byzantine process of university administrators and people meeting out punishment to him. It was really from that point on that I became interested in some of the stories that were happening at other schools. I just noticed that there were more and more of these stories coming out of academia and that some of them were quite shocking and I think a lot of people would be quite infuriated at some of the stories that not only happened before I started working on the film, some of the stories in the film, but they're still happening today. How did you um, discover that these things were, were becoming more and more widespread at other schools throughout the country? The Internet was just starting to take off in popularity right around the time that I was graduating from college. And so all of a sudden, there were news stories that were not getting covered elsewhere that you could get access to by going online and by looking at different sources. There was also a seminal book called The Shadow University, which ultimately led to the founding of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And they're a group based out of Philly. They're nonpartisan. They defend all comers. And their job is basically to protect students, faculty members, and administrators who have their free speech or free thought rights trampled on campus. They built up a massive documentation about all these cases. They had news stories. They had uh, legal opinions, letters that had gone on back and forth between them and the students involved, and the purpose of that was to establish a paper trail. A lot of the stories that I ended up covering had already been covered by media. They had already been adjudicated to one degree or another by FIRE or by some of the legal allies that FIRE helps put people in touch with, but unfortunately there's still a lot of campuses that haven't quite gotten the message from the courts that these are not close calls usually uh, unless it's a private institution in which case they can set whatever rules they want on a public campus at least they're beholden to the First Amendment and that's been upheld by the courts time and time again that's not really right. something that's up for debate at this point no college advertises themselves as a place where the minute you get on campus your free speech rights are curtailed yeah. or you're going to have to think a certain way or you're going to be punished. If colleges did that, I think then at least they would be honest about it. But from FIRE's perspective, if you're enticing people to go to a school with the idea that this is a place where free thought is respected, and then you turn around and you don't actually give students those rights, that's false advertising. These things all allowed me to get access to information that as an academic layperson I wouldn't have been able to get 
uh, any other way. And so altogether, how many different colleges or universities did you travel to uh, in putting together this uh, documentary? I traveled to about two dozen. Uh, we didn't use footage from every school, uh, but I very easily could have made an eight-hour film about academia and still left a lot of material on the table. Things are still happening today. What were some of the one or two most egregious cases that you spotlighted in the uh, documentary? The infamous Stephen Hinkle case at Cal Poly, California Polytechnic. It's part of the California State University system. And as such, uh, the school has a legal obligation to uphold the First Amendment. A student named Stephen Hinkle uh, was hosting flyers around campus to uh, advertise a speech from an author named Mason Weaver, who had written a book called It's Okay to Leave the Plantation. The primary argument of the book is that dependence on government programs is a form of subservience to government and dependence on government and that the only way for people who feel as though they're economically oppressed to get ahead in society is to actually break the dependence on government. But it turns out that the word plantation was considered offensive to a few students in one of the offices where Stephen Hinkle had posted the flyer. Mm -hmm. He went into a part of the campus called the Multicultural Center. But when Stephen Hinkle, a, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed student, went in there, and posted a flyer announcing this speech coming uh, by a black author who was coming to campus, uh, a few of the students in the center took it upon themselves to tell Stephen that if he insisted on hanging the flyer up, they would call the police on him, which they ultimately did. They complained to the police that a student was handing out material of an offensive racial nature. Now, meanwhile, the flyer had the title of the book, yeah. the time and location of the event, a picture of the author, and that's it. That flyer was deemed offensive. Stephen Hinkle was brought up on harassment charges by the university. Uh, he was subjected to uh, a year and a half long process uh, during which this was uh, not only adjudicated through the university disciplinary process, but it ended up in federal court. Stephen Hinkle had, I think, at one point, a seven hour hearing by the school, at which point he was not allowed to have an attorney present, but he was being cross-examined by an attorney for the university. He had another uh, instance where there was another three and a half hour meeting where he was being cross-examined for hanging up a flyer. And it, it was really a setup job. What they were trying to do was scare the crap out of this guy and get him to apologize. If he issued an apology on the record, and then decided, you know what, the school is actually trampling on my rights, I'm going to take him to court. His, any apology that he made would have been used against him. Sure. He refused to issue an apology. Ultimately, the case did go to federal court. And uh, the judge very strongly uh, indicated to the university that this was not going to be a case that they were going to win and that it would be in their best interest to settle the case. Ultimately, they settled. They paid uh, Hinkle $40,000 for his legal fees. This, mind you, was $40,000 out of the taxpayer of California's pocket because it's a public university, so they're uh, underwriting this expense. Even after all of this, not one person from the university ever said that what they did to this student was wrong. And imagine you're a student and you spend a year and a half out of your life battling your own school and battling in court right. when most other people are just concerned about their studies and their grades. Sure. Just real quick, there was another example uh, at the University of Tennessee. Yes. A Sheik student who was conservative uh, but who, who wore a turban uh, was involved with the committee that brought in speakers to the campus, uh, most of whom were ended up being sort of left-leaning speakers politically. And uh, this person was outspoken about it and ended up receiving a death threat. Students were brought up on charges for the Halloween costumes that they wore. Uh, some white students dressed up as the Jackson 5 on Halloween uh, at an off-campus party also. This didn't even occur on campus. But as a result, their entire fraternity was punished. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do by highlighting the case that you just referenced was not only show what the school did in that instance, but show that it was completely counter to what they did in another case that was concurrent with that case. But there was a student, Sukhmani Singh Khalsa. Uh, he's a Sikh student. 
Uh, as you mentioned, he wore a turban, had a long beard, um, and he was on a committee that was bringing speakers to campus. He wrote an editorial for the school paper in which he criticized the group that was bringing speakers to campus. Now, mind you, this group was taking student fees. These fees are mandatory fees that students have to pay. So students are being forced to pay into this fund, and out of the fund, they were bringing speakers to campus. But what Sukhmani found objectionable was that all of the political speakers tended to be on one side of the aisle ideologically. So he wrote an editorial in the school paper uh, criticizing the group. Eventually, he ended up resigning from the group out of frustration uh, because nobody was willing to, uh, to consider bringing someone to campus who ran counter to the prevailing ideology of the folks that they brought. So after he resigned from this group, he was left on the mailing list of the students who were in the group. So after he left, and they think he's not on the mailing list anymore, one of the students actually wrote, and next time you see one of these ragheads, shoot him right in the face. That was the email. Now, the school never punished that email. That's basically a, de a death threat. It is a death threat. And the interesting thing is, if Sukhmani had not been a conservative, if he had been a liberal, and someone had said, shoot this guy with the turban in the face, I guarantee you the school would have done something about it. On a college campus, people get divided up and put into these different groups. And if you're in a group that's considered a favored group, you generally have the school defend you. If you have a different point of view than the one that you're quote unquote supposed to have, all of a sudden the protections that you have fall away. So nothing was done in the case of uh, the death threats against Sukhmani, while at the same time the school was punishing students for dressing up as the Jackson 5 on Halloween. There's so many instances of these sort of double standards. You try to, uh, to speak to these administrators at these various schools. You emailed them, you called them ahead of time to schedule an appointment. They don't respond to you. You physically show up with a camera and a microphone to try to talk to the chancellors or the presidents of the schools to find out about these punishments selectively doled out. And you seem to hit brick walls everywhere you go. In the video, you're being ex escorted out by the police. Yeah, I got the police called on me more than I ever thought would ever happen in my life in putting Indoctrinate You together. Because I focused on stories that were already covered in the media and where the facts were already pretty well established, a lot of the administrators at these schools who were involved in these cases were understandably reticent about anyone looking like they're from the media coming over to try to cover them. Mm -hmm. Because they'd already played out in the media. They've already yes. kind of gotten burned by the negative publicity. Did, but, did you ever try to show up to any of their offices without the camera and the microphone and just with, just with a notepad and just say, hey, I'd like, I'm a concerned citizen or community member and I'd, I'd like to find out about this or that? Yeah, I did that at my university in particular. We did that a couple times where we tried to go in a day before and yeah. make an appointment. But if I didn't tell them that I was working on a film right. about this, I might have had a little bit better luck, but I did feel as though it was important, especially at the public universities. Taxpayers are paying for these things, and I think we have a right to know if our tax money is being used to punish people for their political views, I think that's something that people have a right to know. So especially in the case of public universities, and certainly at the case of my own alma mater, I felt that it was uh, pretty well justified to try to get someone on the record to actually talk about what was going on. What is your personal theory as to why this exists on college campuses today and why it has become so illiberal today in the last couple decades? That is a very good question. Some people would trace it all the way back to the Frankfurt School in the 1920s. Some people might trace it back to kind of the, the campus unrest that occurred in the 1960s where a lot of people ended up not only protesting on campus, but uh, because they were protesting the Vietnam War and because there was a draft at the time, I think academia uh, ended up bringing into its ranks a lot of people who needed to go into academia in order to avoid the draft. Right. I'm not judging anybody who doesn't want to go to fight a war that they don't believe in, but 
a lot of academia changed between 1960 and 1975. And I think the inflection point was somewhere between 1965 and the end of the Nixon administration. Right. And that was really where there was a massive influx of people in academia who were pretty much uniform ideologically. And I think the real problem is a human trait that isn't limited to any point on the political spectrum. Once you get to the point of having 60 or 70 percent of a community thinking uniformly on a given issue, the people who don't have that point of view become further and further ostracized, they become more marginalized, they become more demonized, and I think that one of the things that's happened on college campuses has been that because the academy got so heavily weighted in one direction ideologically, people started acting tyrannically. And I don't think that that's necessarily a problem with leftism per se. If you look at human history, there is a tendency of people to always try to shut down points of view that they don't agree with. Right. And I think that that's what you're seeing here in academia, that it's become so ideologically one-sided that groupthink has taken over. If universities put one-tenth of the effort to achieving ideological diversity as they do to achieving diversity of appearance and race and gender and sexual preference and all that, that we wouldn't have this problem. But academia today is focused only on diversity of appearance, and that's the odd thing. It's supposed to be a marketplace of the mind, right. but that's the only diversity of intellect, diversity of opinion, seems to be the only type of diversity that colleges and universities are not willing to embrace. Since you've completed this documentary in 2007, what has been the reaction that you've gotten both from within academia and from outside of academia? Literally hundreds of people contact me after Indoctrinate You came out to tell me that maybe they were a professor on a campus or an administrator on a campus and that the things that I'm showing in the film are things that they experience on a daily basis. And they just want to say, you know, good job for covering this. Frankly, I was expecting an overwhelmingly negative reaction to it uh, among academics. I, I think it would be too hasty to say that we're at a tipping point. But I think that there are enough people now who recognize the problem, who recognize that other people see the problem, that we might start hearing more voices stand up for free speech and free thought on campus. Just as groupthink requires a critical mass of people to have one point of view, sustaining groupthink requires a critical mass of people whose views are in the minority to keep their mouths shut when these things happen. And I think that as a result of shining more of a light on it, the fact that more and more attention is getting paid to this issue I think is giving more people enough of a level of comfort where they feel as though that they can speak out and they haven't felt as though they can speak out before. So my message to anybody watching this would be that if you see these injustices happening on your campus, speak out. People will defend you. It, it might not be easy, but you will ultimately prevail. And I think that if enough people actually stood up for their rights in the same way that Stephen Hinkle did, in the same way that many other people in my film did, that they would find that this environment would change. Because it's a very obviously not self-sustaining environment on campus right now. I don't think that massive, massive changes are needed. We have to get back to understanding that we need to respect different points of view. And I think that academics have to get back to a place where they recognize that there is value in diversity of opinion, that actually students are getting ripped off if everybody thinks the same way, and if you can get through four years of college without having your point of view challenged. In one of the odd ways, conservatives get more of a, a better education than anyone left of center, right. because their views are getting challenged. Yeah, so exactly. The center student, I could spend four years in a, in a college and not once ever have any of my most basic assumptions challenged. Right. Evan, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Evan Maloney, thanks again for joining us here on Inside Academia. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it. All right. I'm Andy Nash. This has been InsideAcademia.tv. Please join us again next week as every week as we take you for a look behind the Ivory Curtain.